Let's go ahead and make sure that everyone is seeing it. The click live button on Facebook is happening. Well, Facebook is live. The click live button on YouTube has happened and we are counting down, counting down. Looks like the ad is playing for everyone who was hanging out already, but we'll be there soon. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh man, <sighs> Yuri just complimented me on my born broad broadcasting skill of just throwing out gibberish for a constant stream so right now the ad is coming through Teresa's here Kurt Kais is here Matthew Costanza Blake Fair Kathy Hennahan John Henry Maurice JHM we are live so we have Facebook live hanging out with us we have YouTube live hanging out with us and this is fun John Henry says I'm live Woo! I gotta skip the ad I never skipped the ad on my test of the live so now everything's there the audio sounds good too Okay, sweet. I am going to mute that audio. It's coming through all right. Those of you who know me very well, give me word. Is the audio too quiet for me or at any point too quiet for Yuri and Alan? Let me know. I will bump it up. So now that I have these verified and working, I am going to change this window into a little smaller window. So welcome in, everybody. We're just about to get started. You can see the countdown timer has ended, but I am not going to go formally live until I hit that intro button. And I'll be using the intro of Milky Way Wednesday today just because I don't have a snappy animation for a Milky Way roundtable yet. And for those of you who are new to a live stream with me, I want you to know about Milky Way Wednesday. I want you to get out there and join us for Milky Way Wednesday sometime. It's live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. And if this is working, what I'm doing Doing today multi broadcasting to YouTube and Facebook then I'm going to keep doing this for my Milky Way Wednesday and keep it on Facebook and YouTube at the same time why not all right looking at this okay check in the comments I want to get some comments on Facebook coming through if you guys can confirm that you have this working on your end send me a chat over on Facebook so I can verify that everything is gold there we're getting lots of comments on fa on YouTube saying audio good audio's good Teresa Rice made it and we have sound levels good on the YouTube's Kurt Kai says to, uh, the molar says love these videos <laughs> all right you already love it we just barely got started fantastic unless you're referring to Milky Way Wednesday then the molar thank you so much Alan says good audio Bob says good audio Nihar says audio is good and whoop, doo, doo, everyone's confirming that everything's good Kurt Kai says welcome Yuri and Alan and I'm just about to welcome Yuri and Alan so let's go ahead and get rolling I need a Facebook comment come on a Facebook comment key frame rate is too low at Facebook says that's not true Everything is solid right now. I wonder why you would say that. But we have some viewers over on Facebook. Give me a word with the chat. And you know what? Let's get started. So that is my opener for Milky Way Wednesday as we're talking about star, star photography, typically only Milky Way. I'm a very, you know, Milky Way centric photographer. I definitely don't veer out much into different areas, but welcome in. I'm Aaron King with Photog Adventures and today we're going to spread our information out over Milky Way and some deep sky and Yuri's going to talk about a lunar eclipse picture that he has. So that is going to be fantastic. So let me go ahead and bring us in to talking with our crowd let me go to the first the audience crowd I've got this chat window over here on my shoulder on my left shoulder and we have the Facebook chat that is gonna come through and the YouTube chat We've got a hey Alan from Kurt Kai's good afternoon from William William where are you when it's good afternoon you must be near Chile time zone because it is only 11 o'clock in the morning for me Mike Spivey thumbs up hi Alan everyone's saying hi to Alan and Ruri maybe I should let them actually see them so let me go ahead bring them in bring in their audio and welcome Yuri Beletsky and Alan Wallace hey guys everybody come on in and you can say stuff I believe they'll be able to hear you who wants to go first Yuri hi, tell us real quick how's the weather out there he's in the Atacama Desert right now right um, hi, hi everyone um, I'm in Atacama Desert right now, but unfortunately, it's super cloudy here. <laughs> so I'm what? so sorry about that. <laughs> that is just, that is depressing. Yeah. <laughs> so with you being out there happens, seasonally, uh, are you there uh, month for a month or two? How long do you stay? Because this is your work living out in the Atacama Desert at the observatory, isn't it? Right. Uh, I'm a professional astronomer, so I work in the desert. But uh, this time is just my private visit. I came here just for taking pictures on the Milky Way mostly. So yeah, that's, that's a private visit. Oh, right on. Now that picture behind you that you're using for your Zoom background, is that mm -hmm. one of your own? 
Yes, that's one of my own. I took it at my place of work at my professional observatory. So it's a really nice, it's one meter telescope, the dome of one meter telescope behind and the Milky Way I took like a couple of years ago. I still like it, it's very beautiful. And I mean, it just gives you atmosphere of working at the observatory. It's exactly how it looks like. Minus oh, the color, of course. Man, looking at that, I think immediately about how it's oriented the same way that the Northern Hemisphere sees the Milky Way with the Roa Fuki complex on top, but you're in the Southern Hemisphere. Is that just certain times of the year that you see it rotated like that? <laughs> oh, you know what? You're right, Alan, you're seeing that I have this extra video of me. <laughs> Uh, I really hate Alan Wallace, and I'm trying to block him from being seen. <laughs> what one is this? Oh, uh, that is this one right there. I was enjoying right Aaron King for a moment. Uh. Were you? Because sometimes I don't enjoy it. I'm too short, and I'm losing my hair. I wish I had hair like you, Alan. <laughs> now everyone can see Alan Wallace in, in the UK. Yuri, my last question about that Milky Way. That orientation, is that consistent in Chile, or does it do the upside-down view that we would see in Australia and New Zealand? Well, upside-down to me. Not really upside well, down. Well, it's, it's, it's definitely like upside down to you. I mean, everything is upside down here. So this is why it's it's really cool in a way from those from the, coming here from the uh, northern hemisphere. It's very unusual. Yeah. But for us, it's, yeah, we are used to this. Yeah. Well, your picture is oriented in the way that I would expect it to be. Is that just the time of the season? Do you know what month that was captured in? Yeah, it's just the time of the season. It was our uh, fall season. So with the Milky Way just rising in the morning, yeah, that's, um, I see. that's typically what we get. So if you come to Chile starting from this month and uh, for the next few months, you will see this picture in the morning. It's very beautiful. I'll use this lint roller as today's visual <laughs> aid of the Milky Way. And when I see the Milky Way, let's say the core is the big white part. And this white part at the horizon, it does this, you know, and then dips. Yeah. That's all I get. Yuri, yours rises in the morning and goes up like that and then does a rotation at all during the day. <laughs> what does it do? It's basically, just to give you an idea, it's part of uh, the Milky Way core. It's goes through the zenith. So... That's why it's the best really place to observe the Milky Way because you can like oh, yeah. stay in the middle of the night and you see the galactic core just, you know, on top of your head. That's just perfect. <laughs> yeah. I'm so jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> now, the astrophotography business, that's some big bucks, right? As a scientist, you're making tons of money doing that. Uh, that information is classified. <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> yeah, not to <laughs> yeah, we don't see a lot of astrophotographers climbing off of the, getting down from the observatory staircase and climbing into their convertible nice car. So, you know, Yuri is doing a labor of love as well as living the life that a lot of us would probably really love to do. Now, let's also talk about Alan Wallace. Alan Wallace, you're in the UK. Is it cloudy yet again? We had the first clear night last night in what feels like the longest time ever. <laughs> so then did you get out with it and do anything or was the moon in the way? Of course I did. I was out, I, I was out all <laughs> night. I stayed up until moonrise, which was like 6 a.m. And then crashed out for a few hours. And I've spent the day trying to help some friends in Ukraine. They're trying to escape the country. Oh, my. They're stuck at the border. Yeah, I so I, I was yeah. literally helping them, speaking to a member of parliament in Turkey, whilst I remembered that I was supposed to be on the Milky Way round table, so I'm so underprepared for this. <laughs> no worries. This is going to talk about stuff that you already know. There is nothing that you could do wrong in this round table. Just answer my questions and don't hide any secrets from us, and we're good. Ooh, I feel like you're holding a, holding a gun to my head. I know, right? No more secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, all our solidarity and feelings go for the people out in the Ukraine, for sure. I mean, we're all watching it. I hate that it's a bit of a TV special when we kind of don't connect enough with the emotion of what's really happening, and it kind of hits home. In a time of peace that we've been living in, thankfully, we live in the countries we live in, and it's been decades since this kind of action has happened with countries that you know are similar in our lifestyles are just seeing someone go to the store like i would in a regular car and being in a tank being you know hit by a tank or being in a situation yeah. where you have a russians being that hostile it is insane and crazy to think about and just be grateful for where you are be grateful for distractions like we're going to have this hour as we're talking about milky way photography and be thankful that we have all the time and ability to do so from chile and the uk Stoked that you guys are here. Sorry for everyone who's having any troubles, but let's celebrate the Milky Way and celebrate the night sky. So, so everyone in the chat wants uh, mine and Yuri's audio to go up. 
So I did bring it up a little bit. I okay. let me know if everyone, because unfortunately this is so delayed. Steve, Aaron, lower your audio and booze. Oh, boost probably all audio. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> boo. Well, I will lower myself since I am obviously very loud and make sure that their audio comes through. He says better, so hopefully that's better. Let me just go ahead and really boost it. I gave you guys a 10 plus gain, but we might as well go for a little bit more. Let's do it at 19, 20. Tell me if this is too much. Alan, real quick, so we can test the audio. Tell us what you captured last night since you went out in the clear sky. I have been on a bit of a commercial shoot last night, so I've been sent a bunch of Samsung phones. Oh. Um, and we're in the middle of making a little advert for, for the new Samsung phone. So they wanted me to photograph the Milky Way. Ooh, with it. Um, well, it kind of went okay, I guess. <laughs> I'm hoping their standards are not as high as mine. I mean, I've got some nice shots of Orion and... Um, but yeah, I couldn't get the Milky Way call this morning because the moon was in the way. All oh, right, moon rose on you before it got to that point. Yeah, it's a bit of smartphone astrophotography last night, which I know Yuri is very bloody good at. <laughs> yeah, you do smartphone <sighs> photography, Yuri. Well, not on the regular basis, but yeah, I kind of do, and uh, it's amazing what smartphones can do these days. It's absolutely incredible. So I highly recommend you to watch the Alan Wallace. Uh, video Alan, he did amazing video on the smartphones things what you can do and just you know go into his channel watch it it's it's incredible and uh, when people ask like us like why why are you going to use this smartphone for astrophotography it's not serious it's on well check out the images on alan's channel i mean you will see the what we actually can do now with smartphones right it's amazing that you well, can pick it up important that many people overlook that the sm the smartphones is always with you pretty much these days. So wherever you go, smartphone is always, you don't have to carry any equi heavy equipment, any like a heavy tripods. So, which means you go to a trip with your friends, you know, by the fireplace and you can snap a really nice picture these days. So it's very impressive. Yeah. I wonder when it will come to the point where the back of a camera is literally like an, a smartphone and the lens connected to it is just using that same tech. It's going to be interesting to see where we go in 10, 20 years with how our phones and digital devices work. A lot of people are stoked to edit their own and do all that work, but AI is taking some people's attention. and. The way that AI helps out, it's great. And let me know if the audio for me, they said I was too low, but Alan and Yuri were great. So hopefully we've equalized right now and everything's solid. So I want everyone to know that we are doing a Milky Way roundtable for the first time this year. This is a Milky Way Photographers Guild feature. Those who are in the guild will get these exclusively. But today with Yuri and Alan, I didn't want to hold this back to just the guild. I wanted to keep it public and to let everyone know about the guild. So go to MilkyWayPhotographersGuild.com if you want to join us out there. It's, a, it's like a Facebook group without any of the ads, without any of your ex-girlfriends contacting you to see how your marriage is going, and you don't have any of those distractions of life and Facebook withholding anything. So it's a lot of fun if you want to join us out there just to hang out with some peers and talk about your photography. So then, way too low, AJ says. Okay, for me, maybe. Um, Joe, I don't know what Bob, what you mean by Joe, but Joe, hey. And Mike Spivey says it's fine. So I'll just turn myself up just a little bit. Please turn up your mic volume. Mahalo. Thank you, 808 Flyer. And I will turn this up just a little bit and make sure that I am not talking when they are talking. And then we'll be set. Oh, Alan Wallace says, hey, I will come to Cusco for sure. You want to go join faster down there in Peru? Because <laughs> Yeah, awesome. man. <laughs> yeah, we were chatting on Instagram recently. I think that would be amazing. And I'm sure Yuri would, would pop up as well. This is going to be very cliched first thought for a Peru thought, but of course I think of Machu Picchu, and I don't know how the Milky Way lines up there with the mountain. I don't range. think you can go and visit at night. I'm pretty sure when I looked into it last time, you couldn't go there at night. Uh, what about some special permits or permission? Any chance, you think? Yeah, like a secret ops mission. No head torches. Undercover. Well, <laughs> I turned my volume up back again because yeah, Matt just said audio wouldn't... low. Go ahead, Yuri. What were you saying? Yuri mentioned that from Chile, he might have some tech issues with yeah. connections, and right connection, now he's frozen a little bit. What did you say, Yuri? Yeah. Oh, it's cutting out too much. We'll have Yuri back on here in a second when you have a connection. If you Feel free, Yuri, to jump out of the call and come right back if you need to. But uh, I'll talk <coughs> with Alan first. So to get this discussion going about, oh, Faster says Machu Picchu was a little tricky because of the entrance of the rainforest. So that's also a problem. 
Um, lower Allen by three or four decibels, he says. And I think I got that somewhere like that. I wish it was that controlled, Kirk. I'm not going to change the filter. I'm just going to bring the volume slider down. Hopefully, we got our good place where you guys can hear them, and it'll be fine. So, Alan, to address the beginning of this presentation, the beginning of Milky Way Roundtable, we wanted to talk about some of our recent images and a capture that you've done. Is there anything in the last six months that stands out as an adventure that you can share and tell us kind of the story behind it? It might not be as good as your story of yelling so much at the, the girl at the top of the mountain who was doing the pose for you in front of the moon, and then the military guys nearby think that you're their drill sergeant telling them to do some maneuvers in the middle of the night. It might not be that good, but do you have any other good stories to share recently? Um... You know, I'm going to have to quickly check what I've done. Yeah, go <laughs> ahead. Yuri is back visually. Um, How are you doing for audio, Yuri? Uh, I, I hope it's good. I can hear you perfectly. I'm sorry, my connection isn't very stable here in the desert. but um, uh, No worries. You're still making us jealous that you're at Atacama Desert. That is a bucket list item for most of us here. Oh, no, you should come. Definitely. <laughs> Someday, for sure. <laughs> Just yes. for the Milky Way. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, I know. It's amazing. Yeah, uh, it really is something else. You've been down there, Alan. That's right. Yeah, I've been out to Chile. I was down there recently. Well, I sort of transited through Chile to get to Antarctica recently and tried to meet up with Yuri, but I, I, we just couldn't connect. Um, ah, too bad. Just didn't work out, yeah. Did you find an next, image that stood out to you? Oh, sorry, Yuri, what were you going to say? No, no, I'm saying next time in Wales. See you all in Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Any time, man, seriously. <laughs> so Dude, I haven't been able to shoot much. I mean, I just come back from Antarctica where you know it's like close to the south pole and summer mm, so dull light, like, what, all light. <laughs> what am i gonna do here <laughs> and um you know every day i didn't realize how cloudy antarctica was it's like mm. the cloudiest continent in the world and i was sharing instagram stories where we had like sunshine in the daytime and like people were sending me messages like do you know how lucky you are to get sunshine in antarctica right now and um it just kept teasing me like like we kept getting these beautiful sunny days and then as soon as darkness started to fall it would just cloud over or we would change location and we would go to a cloudy location so i didn't get to see the night sky but i did come back with an image that i'm saying definitely qualifies as an astro image and that was because we had a, a solar halo oh when you get ice crystals in the in the atmosphere and so you get this nice big ring around the sun so i've got this really cool image of um it's basically just like a field of penguins kind of looking up at the sun and it just looks like a like a religious cult of sun worshiping penguins with this like, <laughs> huge halo inside <laughs> so that was my one astro image that i came back from from antarctica with. how long were you in antarctica um about a week how long did it take you to make it there Four days, five days. <laughs> Nearly as long as you stayed. Yeah, about 10 sticks stuck up my nose along the way as well. Uh, those to keep you from having seasickness? No, PCR <laughs> tests. <laughs> PC oh, I see. They're checking you for COVID. Uh, yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, why would you have sticks up your nose? It's not a UK <laughs> yeah, thing, I'm right? Walking around the ship with like two big <laughs> <those things. laughs> So then, if for those of us who have Antarctica on this like dream bucket list, not exactly something all of us can do as easy as we want to, um, what advice would you give us for? What really went well for you traveling down there that you're stoked that you did it this way? And what would be something that you wish you had done differently? Um, well, good question. Um, so for me, it was it was just, it felt like what the wildest place I've ever been. Like, and I was, I thought we'd be lucky to see whales and stuff, but every day you see multiple sightings of whales and seals and penguins, they are everywhere. Like the wildlife just doesn't stop it. It was really, really crazy. Um, so we saw all different types of whales, and you, you, there's never a boring moment. And yeah, I bet. You know, we went as a photography group as well on the ship with, with Nigel Danson. So just surrounded by a bunch of like minded people, everybody taking photos and sharing tips and tricks. It was, yeah, it was amazing. Awesome. What could have gone better? Clear skies. <laughs> night. Anything within your control that you wish you yeah. had done better? <laughs> um, in my control? Um, no, not really. I mean, it was just, it really was like the trip of a lifetime. Like, it, 
I highly recommend people save up and do it. It's quite expensive to do, but right. it really is just such an incredible place. And, you know, one of the last really wild places on earth, you know? Yeah. So, that's in, that's the stuff that makes you feel like you're exploring, like the original explorers that went to the new world or went yeah. to a location, you know, for the first time ever. Not even sure that Antarctica would exist, you know. That's just insane. Yeah. So I'm getting a bunch of comments that I want to add in here while Alan's talking, but I want everyone to understand that this live Q&A at the very end will be easiest timing for me to address any questions directly to Alan or Yuri. So here's the thing I need from everyone in the audience. If you've already asked a question that you're hoping I would have asked them, I want you to rewrite it in all caps. I want to look for all caps comments at the end, and I will go through each one that is all caps. So just hit us up with questions as we're going through here. Even if it's perfect for that moment, we won't interrupt up these guys we'll just go ahead and do it at the very end so just hit me up with an all caps comment and I will refer to it back in the end and we'll get those questions out to you but just since I brought it up anyway I might as well say that Alan please tell us why you switched your profession I'm a physician and too much into astro I'd like to hear this is from Nihar um, well I, 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 I was never happy as an engineer first and foremost I always felt like an imposter like I can kind of do anything I put my mind to I think and so I picked an engineer and I was good at it, but I was never really happy. And photography, and particularly astrophotography, was the one thing that amalgamated everything I love doing. So getting outdoors, astronomy, capturing the night sky, um, sharing these things with friends and family and inspiring others. And yeah, it was uh, a really easy decision for me, to be honest. Like the second I started, the second I made like, I don't know, I sold a print for £10 or something. I was like, whoa, you can make money from this? And then instantly I was like, okay, this is my this is my calling. You know, I'm getting out of this engineering stuff and I'm, you know, I'm going to go for it. So, yeah, it was a pretty easy decision that kind of made itself, to be honest. Gotcha. Right on. Um, last question. Okay, that's not a real question. JHM asked a question if Yuri ever blinks. I think what's happened, John, is that he was frozen because <laughs> <laughs> he just barely ditched out of the call and he'll be right back. <laughs> the um, there's one question there about the star glow. Can I just address that quickly? Yeah, go ahead since we're waiting for Yuri to come right back on. Go for it. So Steve's asking about the star glow filter because I created a filter called the star glow filter with Case. I can't talk a lot about this because it's, it's a bit of legal issue going on but oh, um wow. uh basically what happened case china i had an exclusive deal with case china to sell the star growth filter i was going to be you know any sales of the star growth filter had to go through me it was my idea i took it to them i was going to get exclusivity so what they basically did was they made stronger versions of the filter to get out of the exclusivity contract cut me out of the deal and sell the filters themselves and make more money what Okay. So I've been screwed over basically, and they're selling these Astro Blast and Dream Star filters, which are not the same as the Stargrow filter. They've been made stronger, and the effect is really, really trash. Um, it, and that was their way of legally cutting me out of the deal. And yeah. And That's now they haven't strange. manufactured the Stargrow for about four or five months. Um, and I'm completely powerless. I say I'm completely powerless. I've just found a new supplier in Hong Kong, so I'll hopefully be supplying things on my own and cutting case out of my life very soon. But I can't talk a lot about this right now because it's all, all right. very... Interesting. I had no idea it was going to be that much of a backstory. That's crazy. I'm sorry yeah, to hear I'd be, that. I'd be screwed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a yeah. classic business decision where they just cut you out yeah. and don't care. Yuri, welcome back. Sorry your tech is not joining as much as you want, but we're glad yeah, to see I'm you so there. Sorry. Oh, no worries. No worries. Let's get into some of the Milky Way discussion now that you're no longer... Uh, they were asking if you ever blink. They were joking because your face was frozen in time. <laughs> And they wondered, why doesn't Yuri blink? He's a robot. He doesn't want to miss anything. <laughs> so, totally on charge by a USB. <laughs> we've, got <a> question. <laughs> we've got a question right now that I'll take on to get us as a good segue into our discussion about some Star Tracker Milky Way photography, since both of you have done it. And I am really just new to it. I mean, Alan hooked me up with a Move Shoot Move recently. I have a Star Watch Star Adventure, Star Watch Star Adventure right there. Um, with both of you, first off, the question, is there a more stable version two of the Z mount coming out from Chris Whiting? He's curious, Alan, if you have a more stable version coming out. You mentioned one in our hangout a little bit ago. 
Yeah, so we finished the design for the sturdier Z mount. We've sourced some new parts, particularly the, um, the hinges with the, the flaps. Um, we've sourced more stable, much better quality ones of those. So the the first prototype is going to be made in the next two or three weeks. I'm not sure how long it's going to take them. Okay. Um, and then we go from there, refine the design and streamline everything, and make sure the it's going to take a while. It's a, it's a while away, and we haven't made the first prototype yet. But yeah, it's going to. I want to say months. Gotcha. All Some right. Time. Well, yeah. specifically about that Star Tracker gear, I know Alan that you use both that I mentioned. Yuri, what do you tend to use for your star tracking shots? Well, I have about like a five star trackers these days. I, I just collected them over the time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and <laughs> but, your favorite? Uh, well, my favorite, there is no like a favorite. You really have to understand your the goal, what exactly mm -hmm. what you're going to do. For example, uh, one of my favorite in terms of technical performance is the Fornax one. Uh, the Fornax, uh, it's really stable. It's it's a little bit heavy, but probably it's the most stable star tracker I've ever used. It can oh. carry lenses up to like 400 millimeters easily. The tracking performance is amazing. Like it's super smooth. It never failed me, even like at a high altitude in the mountains. Like it's absolutely super solid, like bulletproof uh, tracker. Uh, but again, now when uh, we are talking about nightscaping, for example, when you do like a long hikes, this kind of tracker is not very practical anymore. So you really have to go for something a bit lighter. So for lighter tasks, I usually use my Star Adventure. It's pretty good. It also uses uh, AA batteries, which is super handy. You can buy them anywhere right. these days. Yeah, so that will be my tracker number one now for hiking and Fornax um, uh, light track for uh, for more like serious work when you're in more stable conditions somewhere like a you are not moving a lot. Yeah. Right on. So then, with your star tracking years of collecting them, what was the reason you bought a different one each time? Only different use cases. Do you use what's your favorite one for a wide field view of the Milky Way? The one that most of us are doing right now. Yeah, it's pretty much uh, the upgrade was not really because I'm collecting them. It was like I always step up. <laughs> <laughs> My first tracker which I bought was Kenko Sky Memo. It was just absolutely incredible. Like Japanese technology oh. uh, built like a tank. Like you literally can do anything with this tracker. It's amazing. It's super, but it's super heavy though. Like it's a pain to carry around, but it's very stable. Uh, and Japanese mechanical quality has been incredible. It still works pretty well. So then I was looking for something lighter, and then I went to for like an adventure of looking for something lighter. The Star Adventure came into, into play, and Fornax, uh, probably I went to Fornax because it was really uh, the way the mounted balance, because the Kenko needs uh, a counterweight. If you, if you put a heavy lens, a heavy camera plus the lens, you must have a counterweight. While uh, if you look at the Fornax, it's... Um, it doesn't require any counterweights. You can fix the lens up to, I say, 400 millimeters, and that's it. It's because it's basically a moving arm, so it's much, much more stable in, in exploitation. Right. Yeah. Right on. We're going to go into some of the questions, everybody, specifically that would help you with using your star trackers. As I spent a lot of time this year emphasizing star tracker Milky Way photography, I mean, James Baker just made a comment. What about the iOptron Skyguider Pro? He's looking into buying his first Skywatch Star Adventurer or star tracker that's move, shoot, move, and he's curious about that iOptron Skyguider Pro. Have either of you used that particular tracker? The iOptron, not. not yet for Yuri, a uh, Sky Guider Pro. Do you know it, Alan? Any experience I, with someone I, else? I know it, but I haven't used it. Um, mainly because it's, we don't really have any suppliers for it in the UK. Oh, like okay. the Skywatchers, you can get everywhere, but the, the iOptron seems to be a lot more popular in America. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the one thing I do know about the iOptron is that the people who buy it normally have to upgrade the wedge because the wedge is really poor quality. Mm. Um, and they normally buy a few extra parts. Um, with the, the declination bracket and the counterweight. Um, so it's like you kind of have to consider those extra costs on top. Whereas most people who buy the Skywatcher package, they just keep it as the Skywatcher package. The wedge is pretty good. The counterweight's really good. 
Right on. Okay. Thank you for giving that opinion. I did not know anything to give James Baker any word on it other than that I have a friend who lives in British, in the UK, or sorry, in the UK. He lives in Canada. That's a different place, Canada. And he lives over in Vancouver in British Columbia, and he has a great experience with his iOptron. So I can say that most of them will work well, James, but you just got to make sure you find one that works for you and then test it out. Steve Stagnani is answering in the text. So you guys can chat in the, behind the scenes there. But let's go into the image that Yuri was going to talk about. Uh, Yuri, you had a recent image that's not exactly a Milky Way image that we were going to talk about. And I have the image here and I'll be jumping back and forth to everybody sharing it as he's talking about it. But Yuri, give us some background for this adventure. Well, the reason why I selected this image, it's uh, because unfortunately over the past uh, like a couple of years, I um, I haven't been doing a lot because of the um, pandemic situation, unfortunately, especially in Chile, where we have been hit pretty hard and we spent in lockdown for like more than a year and a half. So it was pretty much impossible to go out uh, and take pictures. So I kind of switched my attention to the moon because moon, you can easily see it from the, from the city. You don't have to travel. And uh, in November last year, we, we've been pretty lucky because we got, first of all, to see uh, the lunar eclipse in, from Santiago de Chile, where I live. It's the capital of Chile. And the second moment was when I just realized the eclipse will be happening at the moment when the the moon will be relatively low about mm. um so what it means is low i mean relatively low about the horizon so what it means it will give you like amazing opportunity to combine like image of the the eclipse of and some kind of terrestrial you know elements like uh, towers and buildings and stuff like this so it always like it's it's really impressive because you know when the moon is up in your in the sky you can't really do much of the, apart from the taking image of the moon it's not so much really interesting to be honest after you take it like many times so I was super happy to realize first this one. And um, the second uh, unique moment about this eclipse was it was happening in pretty much in the beginning of the civil twilight. So which means the contrast between the moon and the sky is not as you know as great as in, during the night. And in this case, you will get really nice illumination of the foreground elements. Like for example, like in this case, I took an image uh, of the eclipse moon over the tower. It's so-called Costanera Center. This is the tallest building in the South America. And it was just a perfect opportunity like to capture the building and the moon. So once I realized like I can combine those things, I use my uh, trusty photo pills up. If you don't know about photo pills, I really just encourage you to go out and check it because it's really amazing uh, tool which allows you lots of things, things starting from um, planning your imaging shots to calculating your camera parameters, various compositions and so on, so on. Just, just you know, give it a try. So I use photo pills just to plan my exact location where it should be at the given time, such as the moon will be exactly on the top of the building. So many people ask me about like, oh, is it like a composite image? Is it like a Photoshop? I'm saying, no, 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 it's just, it's <laughs> pure math. It's, it's pure mathematics and physics, You nothing magical here. So this application is essentially gives you geographically the coordinates the position where you should be in order to get this kind of shot so that's that's what i did i i knew the height of the building i knew the locations i put this information in the application and then I calculated this point in the city where it should be now the next um, thing which i always advise people when they do this kind of shots it's not enough just to plan your imaging using the photo pills because you know what can happen photo pills knows nothing about the city geometry how how buildings can intervene with your line of sight so you always have to go there before your shooting um, session and check actually visually whether the, your scene will be visible because i've seen many times people planning something going on this on the spot and then you suddenly realize like there is a tree in front or there's exactly. a building in front like there are tons of things which can go wrong so, which I do, uh, if possible, I always go like a day in advance, uh, just to, on the spot, just to make sure that I have a clear sight of of the building and you know and the sky. So that's what I did. I went there. I, I, I did before. I checked that everything was fine, and yeah, it worked just perfectly. Next morning, uh, I was at the spot like uh, 15 minutes before. I set up my camera, and the moon was gorgeous, just you know, setting over the building. And I took a sequence of images and then selected, of course, the best. And uh, another bonus. To, uh, uh, kind of so this image was that since eclipse was happening in the beginning of the civil twilight the building was already illuminated by some light of you know the twilight glow was already illuminated the building so this is why 
when you look at the building, it looks colorful. So the color comes actually from the twilight segment of the sky. It was really uh -huh. amazing, kind of a little bit unexpected to me because I did not expect to get anything like this. But when I saw it, it was like, a, wow, that was an incredible moment like to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, and I was happy this image was then selected as uh, by NASA as astronomy picture of the day. It was just really amazing coincidence. Oh, yes, it was an A-pod, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Looking at this image, the things that we're obviously already jealous of is how well you lined this up. You said you did it in photo pills. I know that there's some missionaries of the planet App Religion over here that will want to talk about it. Steve and Kurt Kais, these guys love Planet App. And have you ever used Planet for photographers <laughs> yet? Yeah. Oh, wait a sec. Okay. Uh, I think uh, just to be clear, uh, all those yeah. apps are just the tools. It doesn't matter which tool you use. As long as you understand what it does properly, it doesn't matter which tool to use. But <laughs> what I can tell you, I actually use both Planet and Photopills because they're very different in a way and they're complementary. And actually, I can do like the whole masterclass or just the whole show about both tools, how to combine them right. and how to take advantage of both of them at the same time. Because for example, for some shots, which I'm doing like here in the mountains, uh, you can see my Instagram page, you will see a couple of more images of the moon. Many of them actually were uh, used, to, uh, I used both of tools for the planning. Again, there are various reasons. It's, it's a long story how to use them. But exactly. And there's one fantastic feature of Planet is that you can put in like a terrestrial object as a marker and declare its height and width. It, you didn't take advantage of this in this particular case, though. You were just on location and matched it up that way. In this particular case, you don't need it because, again, it's super easy to do in photo pills because I know the height of the building. And then I just, you know, when I calculate the position of the moon, I add this value to my calculation. So it's, it's easy. But uh, planet, yes, it, it has a possibility to, to implement like a now, not just, you know, squares or cubes uh, model. You can design your own 3D model these days and just put it as an input and you can use this three-dimensional three model of, of an object to plan your imaging yeah that's it's a great application i love it too that's what i'm saying photo pills and planet i highly recommend both of them they're amazing tools it sounds like everyone's already signed up mentally for you to come back and do that master class on those apps and so if you're ready to do that let's do it <laughs> because they are excited to hear your master class on the topic so this image is fantastic everyone's saying fantastic image yuri incredible capture wow they're all talking about eclipses in 2024 that they want to be there for the solar eclipse that's coming through the united states and everyone's getting excited nice image for sure says mike an amazing shot from nihar so they're loving the image they're loving how it lines up so perfectly perfectly on top of the building. I'm immediately jealous that you got that like fishbone coloring that went right through the windows with that twilight period. That's gorgeous. It is quite an interesting shot. I love how there's nothing else other than the top of that building and the moon. Fantastic work. Uh, did you Thank panic you. at all that the eclipse was going to change on you by the time it lined up perfectly on the building? Um, no, I didn't because I'm a scientist. I... <laughs> I believe in math. <laughs> in, this, <laughs> in this case, you know, it's the difference between um, planning a shoot like this in the casino. In the planning the shoot, you're not gambling. It's not a gamble. Right. It's the it's the result. It's because of the math. This is this is why we can send aircrafts uh, in space in the in the air and they fly. That's why we can send jab like a telescopes in space and they go exactly the same location where we wanted them to be. That's because there is a, lots of physics and math behind. So when you know this, it's basically the only thing we, which can um, prevent you from taking this image. It either like a nature itself, for example, clouds, yeah. or your camera fails on the spot. That's it. That's pretty much. Otherwise, in terms of location, it's guaranteed. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> So one of the topics that I've been keying on at the beginning of this year, since we were beginning the whole season of Milky Photography soon, we weren't necessarily having a great opportunity for that Milky Way core, a lot that what most of us are excited about. So I've been keying on saying, hey, get out for Orion, get out for Orion, the northern end of the Milky Way band. There's other parts in the sky that are just gorgeous. Um, starting with you, Alan, um, what are some of the shots that are your favorite targets when you're not just shooting the core of the Milky Way? What other astro things do you absolutely adore? Oh, man, there's so many. I mean, the Aurora is probably the, the most fun because it's very dynamic and it changes very quickly. It's really exciting. Whereas Milky Way is nice and slow and planned. The Aurora is like a, a surprise bomb. You, know? <laughs> you just right. don't know what it's going to be. Um, I love... So in the summertime here in the UK, we get... Um, in Wales, we get bioluminescent plankton. 
Oh, awesome. Um, lighting up the shores. I know you had a really nice show in California a couple of years back. The, the waves just turned that like electric blue. So like cool. you said, Orion, the winter constellations, the winter circle, Gemini, Auriga, Taurus, all of those look incredible. Um, had some, we had a really nice crescent moon with Mars and Venus this morning. I love it when you get the moon and the planets in those twilight colors. Oh, um, yeah. Yuri's got some beautiful moon and planet twilight images. Um, I mean, there's so much, man. There are so many. I'm going to ask you some more questions, specifically how you capture some of those. But Yuri, what's your list of favorites? Do you have a, a list that differs at all? Well, um, I don't know. I actually like pretty much everything. There is not like, of course, the galactic core. I mean, what we call galactic center is probably the most striking object. It's really difficult even. I'm not even, I'm a professional astronomer. I've been in like so many years in professional astronomy, observing the sky for many, many nights. And you never, never, ever can get used to this, to this image, you know, when the galactic core just rising above the horizon, it's like absolute incredible moment. Like <laughs> when I observe like a professional telescope, I try to go outside all the time just to take a look at the given night, just see, wow, that, that, that's really impressive. That, that's why I probably I'm still an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> like, you got some pretty nice things down there in the Southern Hemisphere in the week on CA. Eh? Yes, that's true. That's true that we are lucky to be in the Southern Hemisphere when, the, first of all, the Milky Way, of course, the view is a little bit different. So we get... It's we got to see the brightest part of the brighter part of the Milky Way, plus something which you guys don't see this area uh, area around Carina and uh, Southern Cross and Magellanic Clouds. Yeah, that's specifically the Magellanic Clouds. I have not seen them in my life, and I'm looking forward to it. Have you seen a ballad? You've been farther enough south, Antarctica, I guess, huh? Well, it was Antarctica. Yeah, well, we did get to see them in Antarctica. I saw them in Chile. I saw them in um, in the Vicuña Desert and the Atacama Desert. Yeah, it just I mean. And, and... <sighs> It's such a beautiful area of the night sky. You've got the, the Magellanic Clouds, and then you've got the the Crux and the Carina Nebula. Mm -hmm. These beautiful region of the Milky Way, many many bright stars as well, and it's circumpolar. So it's just there in the south every damn <laughs> night the whole year round. Oh. Like, pretty much. Yeah. So let's get into some of the nerdy weeds here on some of the tech settings because I favor in Star Trek photography doing the wide field and doing Milky Way. Even when I'm on Orion, I'm still kind of tracking with the same settings. I'm opening up my aperture as much as I can. I do 1600 ISO and then I go for two minutes or more. I really like to go longer in my minutes. Yuri, we'll start with you. What are some of your typical settings? Can you give us two use cases that you use your Star Tracker and then give us some of of your typical settings and lenses go to for that situation? Okay, let's start first with the uh, second part of the question, the lenses and cameras. Um, yeah. in, terms of ca in terms of cameras, uh, I would say use the camera you've got so far. You don't, have, you don't need the most expensive camera. And um, again, I think it was Alan's uh, channel recently when you did a really nice investigation about uh, the winning images from the last um, uh, contest of astrophotography of the year. The best mm -hmm. of, and I was I was a judge at this contest. By by the way, the Greenwich Observatory um, uh, conducts this contest. It's, it's really amazing. One of the most probably the most pre prestigious in the world. I was the judge last year, and I will be the judge this year as well. I encourage everyone to participate. It's it's really amazing. So uh, ah, cool. the Canon 6D was probably the most like a frequently used camera, and the Canon yeah. 6D. Wow. Canon far. 6D is like how many from 2014, as far as I remember, is like almost yeah. like eight years old camera, which is still being used and it's still great camera for Astro. So what I'm saying is if, if you guys on the budget, it's a no brainer. Just go for the 6D because it's really one of the best. So 6D and, you know, any lens you can, you can get like a cheap, uh, for example, Rokinon, Samyang, all these lenses, they, they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, the only thing we have to make sure just to test the lens when you buy it because you know unfortunately those lenses they used to have a problem with the quality control so not oh. each lens is equal yeah. but uh, any kind of uh, fast lens i would say you can start something with 14 f 2.8 lens then maybe 22 uh, 20, uh, 24 millimeter lens one of those uh, the aperture which you can use i would say probably the faster the better but you should always keep in mind usually wide open lenses the image quality is not really good especially in the corners so it really depends on the lens if you get a lens which is which has an amazing quality across the field, yeah, go for f2.8. If not, try to stop it down to f maybe 3.2, 3.5, maybe a 4. But then you have to increase the exposure time. And then speaking about exposure times, usually we start with exposure, let's say, 
uh, if you use a tracker, I would say do like a maybe 30 seconds in the beginning. Depends. It also depends on the sky brightness. Like let's say if you are in the middle of Atacama Desert when there is no light pollution, you can do even several minutes. But of course, if you're in the light polluted area, you have to kind of your mileage may vary. You have to a little bit adjust your exposure times given the the local conditions. But in Atacama, I usually do uh, something like uh, one minute or maybe. 90 second exposure times i never really go beyond that for one simple reason because it's much more advan adv advantageous to take instead of one image you take a series of images and then combine them so when you combine the images you can do a couple of things well first of all you eliminate the the cosmetic imperfections you can just uh, cut pixels and stuff like this or satellite tracks or you know the plane tracks you can remove and the second thing, you also increase the signal to noise ratios. Essentially, you're removing the noise and the noise goes away as like a factor of uh, square root of the number of images. So, for example, if you take one image, it's single exposure, it's the signal to noise, it's OK. But if you take, let's say, um, I don't know, 16 images, the square root of 16 is four. So in this case, you will be improving your image by a factor of four in terms of noise. So roughly speaking. So this is why I always try to take a sequence <coughs> of then in post process i usually just combine them in in one single image and by the way this is exactly how we do in professional astronomy when we take deep deep images of the sky for example when you see like in, in scientific publications like a hubble te space telescope looked at this object for like a 10 hours it doesn't mean that hubble space telescope was looking at objects for 10 hours you usually take a sequence of much much shorter exposure times maybe like up to two minutes three minutes each and then all those exposures they're combined so this is what we do in professional astronomy and that's what i do in my nightscape imaging right on just the emphasis on the stacking i gotta say absolutely there is a question that came from a friend of mine recently that i'll ask you right now and then mm -hmm. i'll also ask you to answer alan and then you can go into some of the same questions that i asked yuri but the question is he's dealing with a situation where he doesn't want it to go too long because of uh there was a timing issue on when the moon was going to come up and break through on his nice dark view of the milky way so to mm -hmm. save time he was curious if he should should shoot even higher and higher ISO to go for a shorter shutter or if he would just go for less stacks. If you were forced to have only an, uh, let's say half an hour, so it's really tight time constraint, do you tend to bring up your ISO ever really high to go shorter shutter or do you always favor maybe shutter setting or a different setting? How would you tackle a short time frame? Uh, Yuri, you first and I'll have Alan. Okay, I'm here just, I guess I'm advertising Alan's channel, but uh, Alan Wallace, he has amazing uh, explanation of what yeah, is called. Is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is called uh, ISO less uh, camera. So basically, ISO invariance, there is another term. So what it means now, these days, modern cameras, ISO basically means almost nothing. So it's, it's, um, it's not a real increase of sensitivity on your camera, it's just a multiplication factor. So this is why each camera, okay, I'm not going into details, but basically the simple idea, each camera has so-called base ISO. So what it means, anything above this ISO is essentially multiplication of your base ISO. You, changing the ISO does not really give you any advantage anymore. So this is why you kind of have to find this value and then take in images. And you will be surprised, for example, you take this image in the raw converter in Lightroom or Photoshop, and then you can just play with this exposure slider. You can essentially get all your details you want. And it doesn't matter whether your ISO is like 6,400 or 12,000. Uh, 12, so the result will be pretty much the same. All right. But again, just if you want more details, just watch the uh, Alan video. He explained it in, in great detail. Just do it. Okay, Alan, do you want to give us a Cliff Notes version in two minutes? <laughs> I feel like my assistant did a good job for me there. <laughs> <laughs> Yuri Bolesky as an assistant is a real privilege. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I mean, yeah, boosting the ISO to, just to bring your shutter speed down doesn't really make sense because when you change the shutter speed, you change how much light you're collecting. When you change the ISO, you're not changing how much light you're collecting. You're just changing how much your camera digitally boosts the brightness of the image. So I would definitely opt for the longer exposure for the individual subs because the more light you collect, the, the better quality the images are going to be. Because the more light you collect, the better the signal to noise ratio. So you've got more light compared to noise in your image. So always go for the longer shutter speed if you can. Right on. And then some of your situations of doing like a deep sky versus a Milky Way, what are some of the settings that you play around with, Alan, when you do a deep sky star tracker? 
Um, I normally just aim to get a well-exposed histogram at ISO 800. Um, and for most cameras, you get a really clean image if you're well exposed at ISO 800 these days. So it'll be a case of starting with test exposures that are, I don't know, say like ISO 12,800. And then every time I half the ISO, I double the shutter speed. Um, and so sort of keep going until, you know, there's no star trailing. Um, and once I'm at 800, I'm usually pretty happy with, with that length. If you're in a, a city or a more urban environment, you, you might not be able to expose for that long because your image will be so bright from the light pollution. So you might want to try a light pollution filter and just make sure you're not overexposing any parts of the image. Okay. Right on. Uh, Yuri, when you do like an Orion and you want to capture horse head nebula, have you, I, have you had that experience with this tracker yet of capturing horse head nebula? That's a pretty cliche one to do. Have you already done it? Well, I've done it, but uh, I was not really focusing on nebula itself because, mm. I mean, I'm mostly interested in like a wide angle shots, uh, not like a specifically deep sky. I used to do it much uh, like a long time ago. I even had my um, personal observatory, which I built myself. and But awesome. then at some point, I kind of switched my passion because uh, I found that nightscapes are much more interesting for me. Yeah, so that's why I'm not so much into astro, like a big astrophotography anymore, but more like a wide field stuff. Okay, right on. When everyone's thinking about some questions that you might have for Yuri and Alan, I want you to think right now and add any questions in all caps that you might have pending already. I know I've seen a few that I'll be coming back to, but first I want to point everyone over to the Instagram channels of Alan and Yuri. If you go to Yuri's, it is at Yuri Beletsky. You can find him there, and Alan Wallace is simply at Alan Wallace. So you can find both of them. Right now, I can follow back Alan Wallace. I'm going to click that right now. Apparently, I wasn't following you already, Alan. So <laughs> Exposed. <laughs> <I'm> exposed. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my credibility went way, way down. Together. I thought you were my friend. <laughs> <laughs> friends don't share friends' Instagrams. No, I should have already clicked that. I'm not sure how it happened. But... <laughs> If you haven't also, if you are like me and a friend of Alan, but you haven't clicked it yet, click it right now <laughs> and click it for Yuri's and follow him. I'm check that I'm following you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you're judging me. So everyone, thank them for being on here and thank Alan for subscribing by subscribing to his YouTube channel if you aren't already. I know hundreds of thousands, oh, 100,000 plus people are, and I'm very jealous of that and very love. I'd love to be there someday with myself. So with the time coming to an end, it's 11.51, we have nine minutes left if we go by the pure hour but alan and yuri even though i'm asking this in front of everyone else are you free with your schedules for a few extra minutes of live q a yeah sure yeah absolutely yuri, yeah, yeah. works not pulling sure. you away okay awesome because we'd love to address all of these and also get a few more questions in when you're thinking about wide field photography and you're going to do a star tracker yuri you have an observatory for a great foreground subject right there behind you what do you tend to favor when you go to a landscape shot for a milky way do you have any favorites foreground subjects that you like well, my favorite, I would say, I love um, to take images of like uh, rivers and lagoons, like in the desert uh, under the stars, because for a few reasons, first, it looks really amazing. But secondly, it's also unique in terms of um, just physical nature, just finding ma water in the middle of the desert. It's always just impressive. And this is something very unusual. That's why it always attracts attention. And I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> well, when you think about your top four locations in the world for Milky Way photography, what would be in that list? Top four? Yeah, oh. I know. I know. Oh, okay. Top so four, for the top four that you visited. Okay. Top four that you've actually been. But if you're thinking bucket list, we'll hit yeah. that up at the very end. But I'm sure that many yeah. of us have been there. Okay. I don't want to advertise uh, my country, but Chile, Chile, Chile. <laughs> <laughs> all for Chile. All for no. I mean, seriously speaking, I mean Chile is probably for me is, is the number one because just of the conditions. I'm mean, Atacama Desert. It's still, I believe, is probably one of the top three uh, best locations in the world in terms of clarity of the sky, cleanness, and uh, and the whole nature. Because it's almost guaranteed result when you go to Atacama Desert in the real time. You, you in the right time, you will get really amazing images, and you will see something which you've never seen in real life. Because when the sky is extremely clear. And when you see like a phenomenon like a gegenschein with the naked eye, it's absolutely incredible. Like you don't even need a camera to see the zodiacal stripe going across the sky, not just, you know, in your camera. So that's what you can see in Atacama Desert. Um, 
A few other locations which I liked a lot, well, Australia. Australia is really amazing. It's beautiful scenery and, and gorgeous landscapes in terms of um, when you see the bush and the ocean. Like, I really like Australia too. Um, number three probably would be Hawaii. Hawaii is really amazing too. Like, it's northern hemisphere, but the clarity of the sky is absolutely gorgeous. Like, it's, it's really, really, really beautiful. Awesome. And um, more, I don't know, top three, top four, four, four. I don't know. Oh, you hit well, it well. You hit it well. United States, actually, surprisingly. I love California. One of my favorite places is um, if you go to Sequoia uh, National Park um, or the forest. It's, it's really amazing. I love this uh, giant Sequoia trees, and it's one of really one of my favorite locations, California. Yeah. Absolutely agree. If it's not having a terrible smoke season, then it is fantastic. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you have to be lucky sometimes, yes. All right. So, Alan, going into Milky Way photography and your Star Tracker stuff, think about two things here. One question that's going to be okay to a person who is struggling with combining their foreground and their sky, what kind of tip would you offer them in their capture part of it? Not Photoshop questions, just could you're capturing, make sure you do X. If there's anything that stands out to you there. And then I have a second question follow up so I don't confuse you on the first question. What do you think about that? Does anything stand out <laughs> to you? <laughs> um, so I think probably the, the best bit of advice is to make sure the, the horizon is quite simple if you're not very good at blending. So if there's a lot of trees in the way, just try and I, I give up on that composition, to be honest. A lot of people move the tracker so they'll take their foreground exposure and then move to the other side of the tree and take a nice clean sky which is a lot easier to blend on um that's personally against my morals i wouldn't do that i, I always leave the tripod in the same position for Amen. for a shot but that's something that some people do to make things easier mm -hmm. but generally if, if i see trees in the way of a shot where i'm thinking of using the tracker i just don't use the tracker um, and so what I'll do instead is I'll, I'll just stack multiple 20 or 30 second exposures, um, which I did in, in Madeira when I photographed the final forest. Um, it would have been amazing to use a tracker, but it just, those trees are so gnarly and complicated. It would have just been so much post-processing work that I never would have got those images out. <laughs> so I did some stacking, which is much easier. The, the software does it for you. and. Sometimes you get little errors on the branches and you can, you can fix them in Photoshop nice and easy. It's always great to hear someone who's more talented than I say that the post-processing effort would be too great, so I just give up on it because I do that all the dang time. Like, you know what? If it's not ready, I'm like, mm, I'll get to well, that later. Well, it's like when, when, when it's a hobby, you've got all the time in the world to do these things, but then when it becomes your profession, like, <laughs> I have like 5% of my time available for taking photos and editing photos. The rest I know of what it, you're saying. But, <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, so you have to be really efficient in the shooting in the field and the editing just to make sure that you, you get the images out because there's so many images that are sitting in my archive that require so much right. work. They'd be, they'd be amazing images, but they require so much work. <laughs> but I'm like, ah, oh, okay, I'll do that tomorrow. I'll do it next week. And they're just sitting there untouched. It's a bit of a shame. Very. Right. Well, then the follow-up question that I asked also Yuri was the top four locations that you go for Milky Way. What would be on your list? I, think, I have to agree with the Atacama Desert. It's, I mean, there's just so much going for it. The, it, the latitude to so the advantage you get with the Milky Way position, passing through the zenith and the Magellanic clouds, the clarity of that desert air is like... It's something else, man. I mean, going back oh, to his man. point about the zodiacal light, the zodiacal light was annoying. It was so bright <laughs> compared to everything else. You kind of see it in the corner of your eye and you think like maybe there's a car coming over the horizon or something. And you're like, oh, wow, it's, oh, it's just the zodiacal light. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, but it is tough. I mean, for, for, for the prize for being the best location is that it's a tough place to shoot. It's ridiculously dry. It's the driest non-polar region of planet Earth. So like you're constantly drinking water and your mouth is dry. Interesting. Yeah. You're at a high altitude. I mean, the, the lowest town in Atacama is like 2,400 meters, which is already like a threshold for altitude sickness. And then to get to good locations, you have to go up into the mountains, which is even higher. And so, yeah, it's, it's a challenging place, but it's, it, yeah, it's just feels like another planet. I mean, the landscape, the wildlife, the plants, everything's just very otherworldly and, yeah, really incredible. Awesome. Number two. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Number I two would that was be, um, definitely be La Palma um, in the Canary Islands. 
um, which is a bit closer to home for me. But the, the one thing I love about La Palma is just you wake up in the morning and it's raining outside in your hotel and it's fine because you can just drive above the clouds it's like, <laughs> it's like the most amazing privilege you could possibly have like it's like you just take off and, and, and end up you know in space you feel like you're touching the stars it's really amazing Awesome. Well, let's um, start the Q and A with this question for you, Alan. Uh, since there's okay. a lot of places that you mentioned that I, I in your portfolio, if you guys haven't gone to Alan Wallace's website, go to alanwallacephotography.com, or you can go to Yuri Boletsky's site. Yuri, do you want me to point? I want to point out the one that you have on your Instagram. It's the fine Instagram. art. Instagram. Yeah, no, Instagram. Just, go there, just Instagram.com forward slash Yuri Boletsky, and you'll go right to it. And you'll see his fineartamerica.com website where you can see more of his portfolio work. And it's just, you look at Alan's and you see these locations that he's gone. There's some really gorgeous work. One thing I love about Alan's photography is that the way he keeps a color scheme throughout his image really well, and they're clean foregrounds, clean shots that have a nice sky. It is brilliant to see the differences between astrophotographers and how they tackle it. You, you might be Eric Benedetti who gets amazing sky air glow colors that are just vibrant like crazy, or you'll get kind of like a monotone blue, cool blue color in Alan Wallace's shots that are just terrific. I, I love them, and it's just, I want you guys to go to their profiles, and we'll talk more about Yuri's profile portfolio here in a second, but let's start the Q&A so we can get through it. We have a lot of questions coming in. We'll start with one from the UK, and this is from Jed Yay. Thornley, and he says, I'm from England in Hampshire, and so he says, Alan, <laughs> oh, <boo. laughs> he says, how are you getting on with the Sony 14 millimeter 1.8? And Yuri, after he answers this, if you have any experience with that same lens, I'll come to you. So the 14 uh, millimeter Sigma 1.8. I say Sigma, but it's not. It's just Sony 14 millimeter. Sorry, I keep adding the Sigma. It's not a Sigma lens. You have it, huh? Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's incredible. I mean, I, I used to use the Sigma 14 mil art lens, which was amazing, um, but it wasn't really good in the corners because mm. the image is so sort of stretched by this bulbous front element, um, and it was had quite a bit of astigmatism. But this lens is half the size, half the weight, um, very similar price, and it performs way better than the Sigma in pretty much everything apart from vignetting, which is fine, but I absolutely love this lens. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I don't use it a lot um, because I'm a bit more addicted to the 24 millimeter focal length, and I like to do panoramas. Um, but this always comes in handy with time lapses or when I do focus stacking. So there'll be times when, I don't know, maybe there's some interesting flowers in the foreground, but they're really small. Um, with an ultra wide angle lens, you can get up, up nice and close to those flowers and make them fill the frame and have a nice sort of Milky Way backdrop. So when I'm doing focus stacking, again, up close and personal to the foreground, always go for the ultra wide. Right on. Um, with that lens, I don't know if you even use a Sony, Yuri. Um, is that lens familiar to you? Um, I haven't been using Sony in my work yet, but it's coming. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> you are switching to mirrorless Sony, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of. Uh, it's time now. Yeah, I, I haven't uh, I haven't used this particular lens, but I've, yeah, I've seen uh, lots of really, really good things about this lens. So are you still on the D850? No, actually, my main camera now it's Nikon D810A. Hmm. Ah, sorry, yeah, yeah, D810. A10, yeah, it's still and it's it's amazing. Uh, it's still it's still pretty good. And as I said, like uh, the camera is becoming less and less important uh, in yeah. this case. As I said I can equally shoot with the 6D, and it's still the images. I, I still like the images as well. It's all about. Uh, it's not about the camera. It's about your experience, how you process the data. Because, uh, you know, when you get experience, you can use, you know, you know, you understand what you're doing and then it's much easier than to take images. So you really know exactly what you need, what, what you don't need and so on. Uh, one of the reasons I'm switching to, to Sony now, it's because of, um, well, like the, the sensor, it's, it's pretty good. And also the flip screen. The flip screen is, is really, really nice. It's essential when you do compositions, especially nightscape photography, when you go low to the ground and trying to position your camera. I had really hard times with my Nikon just to compose things because it's very difficult. Oh, you're so going to love why... the bright monitoring as well, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I definitely, I, I definitely do. need this. Dang. And, um, 
So I'm going to overlay your faces with Yuri's portfolio. Sorry, Alan. But uh, <laughs> this is Yuri's uh, shot. Consider over- it a tattoo idea. I'll get it tattooed <laughs> on my face. <laughs> a tattoo of Yuri's images. <laughs> so then when you're looking at his portfolio, this is where you could actually go and buy Yuri's work and see um, – you know, which one works for you and buy it. But I just, I want to emphasize some of his key focuses. When you heard Alan say this Uh, earlier, that he has a lot of great twilight shots and focus on subjects that are individual subjects, like the moon with some leaves, the moon over these just gorgeous red bands. I'm I'm kind of confused on what the double band is there. That's amazing. And so just looking at Yuri's photography, he has more of a focus towards individual objects and how they interact with the terrain, like the Moai statues right here that have um, the, looks like a Venus. I'm not sure if that's Venus over or one of the bright planets is right over a statue. And it's just gorgeous to feature something like this. Before I go into the rest of the Q&A questions, Yuri, I want to ask you, this tendency to lean towards more of an intimate focus in the sky, something that is a single subject in the sky and featuring it over another landscape piece, it, what do you do to find these lineup moments or do they come with scouting on in person? Well, it's kind of a it's funny answer would be uh, uh, the first will be it's just because of uh, I was hopeless at that moment. I couldn't find anything else. And <laughs> this is why I do this. <laughs> uh, I see. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, generally, I mean, I try to pre-plan things. I mean, if, if there is a way to do it, it's very hard to do um, like in advance, like a photo pills thing. Um, in a way, because I still to plan this kind of shots, you really need to be on the side just to have, you know, do some scouting and try to imagine how you can do it. But um, yeah, but mostly it's more like a random thing because sometimes you you like when you take images during the night, you take one image and then you always look around. You always need to pay attention to this, some, some details here and there. And for example, sometimes I see, oh, by the way, this constellation just going up in this very interesting position. I switch the lens immediately and I, for example, take a much deeper shot or with much longer focal lengths in this direction. And since uh, the night sky does not move that fast, you know, we still have time to, to compose things. So that's why I would say for me, it's uh, really like a by, byproduct. It's not really the goal of my, my photography. It's always like a coming, coming along. Oh, right on. Um, one of the questions coming from the group, Linda says, Yuri, what's your YouTube channel? Do you have one? I don't. Not I think yet. I'm really I'm really bad on camera. I'm not like a That's broadcaster type. And I really admire like you are on style. You're amazing. Like you said, you're a born bro- broadcaster. Like I would, I would <laughs> never be a person like this. I don't know. Just if I start... YouTube channel, I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> I, I could see you being more of the Thomas Heaton kind of YouTuber that goes out in a calm way and just captures what you're capturing and just in a peaceful way share your photography adventure. And so you'd be terrific, Yuri. I'm sure you'd have millions of subscribers faster than I ever could get there. I don't know. We'll see. I, need, I need to get some tips from Alan. He knows how to do stuff. He does. <laughs> He does. So let's hit let's hit all these Q and A questions. I have a bunch of chat questions that have come through in all caps. If you have a question that you haven't written yet, write it in all caps. If you have something that you wish, oh man, I was so excited to have Yuri here, and I wanted him to talk about this. Ask me that question right now. Where you're like, Alan Wallace is here to answer questions about this. I wished he had said X or told me more about this. No matter how narrow casting this might be to a question specifically to helping you, take advantage of this right now and hit me up with all caps. If you want this question asked before we hang up the live stream, make sure you hit me with all caps. I'm scrolling back to the very beginning of the YouTube chat. The Facebook chat, you guys are all pretty silent over there, not talking about much. It must be that there's some of you who are also watching on the YouTube channel and just happen to be counted as a viewer on Facebook, but just hit me up with any chats in all tech, all caps, so I know that that's a question you want me to address. So now I'm scrolling through. Audio good, audio good. That's the very beginning of the episode. Um, but, but, but we talked about case already, and uh, all caps was saying not seeing Alan. You're over Alan. That's when I didn't realize it was happening. I was covering <laughs> Alan's face, so that's going on. A surprise guest. <laughs> I know. We'll reveal <laughs> him later. What's behind door number two? <laughs> Uh, not upside down. The season's run in reverse. Uh, yeah, Steve was just commenting on my term upside down. There's no correct correct orientation. We don't even know what would be the correct up or down. So calling it upside down is a misnomer for sure. Um, 
pop bum 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 all the all cap stuff in the beginning are about my audio or covering up alan's face so let's go on <laughs> ask alan about oh we already did blah 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 is there okay here we oh nope answered that one already here's the first one nevada x tube andy says is there any way to easily remove starlink satellite light trails in milky way photographs either of you want to address that i mean it's a photoshop question mostly um there's a couple of different ways. The first one is to stack multiple images of the same scene. Um, I know if you in, in Windows you use a software called Sequator or Sequator. Yeah. And there's a little tech, tick box for um, select best pixels, I think it is, and that basically gets rid of any plane trails or satellite trails. Unfortunately, it also means it gets rid of meteor trails, so it's something to be aware of. Yeah. Um, the other way to do it, if you've got just a single exposure, um, is to either use the spot healing brush tool in Lightroom, which to be honest, doesn't do a very good job, or go into Photoshop and use the spot healing brush tool there. Mm -hmm. And you make the brush just thicker than the thickness of the satellite trail, click on one end of the trail, and then hold shift and click on the other end of the trail. And that draws a nice, perfect straight line for you and gets rid of the, the trail. Awesome. Anything to add to that, Yuri? Or is that was? No, it's, it's pretty much the same because it's always. Um, I would say it's easier to correct during the shooting. So if you notice the satellite, just just wait a little bit. You know, if there are not so many flying, just you know, wait a minute. The satellite pass by and just take another shot. But if you happen to to have it in your shot, yeah, like Alan mentioned, uh, hidden brush. Sometimes I use clone stamp tools as well. That works pretty well. I mean, but essentially it does the same job. Yeah. It is one of the nice benefits of stacking is that it will basically average out that scenario, but you do end up with mm -hmm. killing your any meteors you might have in the shot. So do either of you have any experience from Helber? He asks, what about strain wave gear, harmonic drive mounts? Have you even heard of that? I haven't. Um, strain wave gear, harmonic drive. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that at all. And it looks like Yuri, you don't have anything. Sorry, Hilbert, we won't be able to help you there today, but we'll go on. Everyone's saying, check out Planet Pro, another emphasis that they would be totally in for that master class from you. Kurt Kai says, I'd love to hear Yuri discuss the way he integrates both Planet and PhotoPills someday. So we'd love to have you back. We'll do that in the guild. And if we can have you back, that'd be great, Yuri. You're awesome. And so you say you're not good on camera? It's not true. You're great. You're fantastic. So then we go through some more of the questions. Uh, but, 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 bum. I'd love to hear the way. Um, okay. Can Yuri, can you briefly tell us what professional projects you're working on currently? Well, currently, um, uh, we are, I mean, I'm an astronomer, so we do my, my main investigation is devoted to study of the young stars. So we use this in the Magellan 6.5 meter telescope to, to study the initial conditions of the star formation okay. and the object like, like a brown dwarf. So we're mainly using the infrared observation for this because a, in infrared, the reason why we use infrared and the reason, for example, JWST is infrared telescope because the, in infrared, we can look through the dust. So all stars, you know, they're born in, in, the, in the molecular clouds. So if you look at this molecular cloud, just... Um, uh, you basically don't see anything inside it's because it's like it's full of dust but if you look in the infrared um, part of the spectrum we actually can see through the dust and we can start revealing the, those objects we can start we will be able to study them so this is one of the reasons why we use an infrared so i'm not really going into like so much details now what exactly we do sure how, yeah but that, that's the idea what uh, what i normally do i'm really stoked can, for the infrared capability of the james webb telescope that's going to be amazing to see what we get yeah yeah, me too. What were you about to say before I interjected? I don't know. That's it. I was saying like if you if you want to just uh, understand like if you did not understand the idea like what 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 is the molecular cloud? Just look at the Milky Way. You know, at night in the Milky Way you see like a bright you know uh, stripe of uh, stars and then the patch like a black patches on top of the Milky Way. So those black regions they actually the molecular clouds. This is the dust in front of you know, between us and the stars. So and this is why if you look in the infrared, we will be able to see through those clouds and see the stars. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so quick gear question for both of you. Um, mm -hmm. What is a good tripod to use for a star adventurer? What would you guys recommend? I mean, sturdiness, what do you like? Uh, Yuri first. Okay, so I use the Photo Pro uh, TC80. Uh, Photo Pro, well, I'm an ambassador for Photo Pro. Okay. And I'm, but I'm not an ambassador in a way like... Uh, because I'm representing the brand, it's because it's really 
really nice tripod and in my case i do imaging high in the mountains quite often in in extreme conditions when the, the temperature is low and sometimes the wind is fierce mm. so i need extremely extremely stable tripod so this tripod is probably one of the best for my task it's a little bit heavy well it's pretty heavy for anything else but again it you should probably choose your tripod depends on your task i would say if you do something for hiking you need something lighter and i prefer carbon fiber pretty much you know any carbon fiber would work just to make sure just you know your camera doesn't fall over and... right uh alan what would you add to that and when it's windy what do you do to help your tripod do you do anything i know some people like to anchor and i find that i end up swinging a bag too much so what do you do Oh, Alan, real quick, your audio is out. I do not hear you. So we'll just get Alan's audio back on a sec. There was a bag recommendation in the past where you put a rock in a hanging bag from the center of your column. But if you don't have that anchored to the ground, too, where it's tight and taut, you're going to have that bag in the wind start swish, swinging back like a pendulum. Oh, yeah. And that just added more vibration and problem than just the wind going around my tripod. So I don't recommend you know? them. Oh, there you are, Alan. Yeah, hey, man. All right, sweet. So what yeah, were sorry, you saying? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a Benro ambassador, so I'm obviously a bit biased <laughs> as well. <laughs> like it's, I've only used Benro tripods. I love them. They've been amazing. I do a lot of hiking, so same with Yuri. I use carbon fiber because it's a little bit lighter. Um, I recently got one of the, um, oh, it's not here, but the Benro tortoise tripod. And the good thing about this is that it has a leveling head built in. Um. The other good thing about having a level in head built in for a star track is that it allows you to rotate the wedge. Some tripods, the center column doesn't rotate and you kind of have to set your tripod up and make sure that the wedge is already kind of pointing north towards Polaris, Right. which when you're on uneven ground is quite difficult to achieve sometimes. So it's nice to have that wedge that I can just turn the, turn the, the star tracker around completely level my, my, my tripod off nice and quickly so that's great absolutely um, agree. keeping it sturdy yeah like you said hanging a bag can often be worse because the bag sways and it takes mm -hmm. the center column with it so um one thing you can do is use like an elastic bungee cord and put the bag on the ground and then stretch the elastic bungee cords between yeah. the center column and the bag um, the other thing I do, which I did this morning because I was on a beach with lots of big rocks is I take a big rock and rest it on each of the legs mm -hmm. and that keeps things nice and steady as well. But obviously you don't always have big rocks lying around. <laughs> right on. Uh, before I scroll into the next question, Mike Farwell says, I have a shot just like Alan's sunflower shot. So when they were looking at Alan Wallace's Instagram, they were seeing a sunflower shot and he's like, I have one just like yours. So awesome. he likes it. Did you also trespass as well? <laughs> 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 Most likely. Uh, let's see. James says, since we started to talk about lenses, anyone tried the new Sam Yang 135 yet? Has I really want to. If want you're lucky to. to buy it, because it's not even in stock as far as I see. I tried oh, yeah? to buy it, but oh, yeah. Well, at least in B&H or Dorama, you don't see them in stock. Not yet. <laughs> All it's right. 135, 1.8, right? This one, yeah. Yeah. I don't no. know gear at all. I I'm not a gear guy, so I'll really. Well, the, the Samyang 135 f2 is kind of legendary in the Astro mm -hmm. world because it's, it's it's so good for the price. So <laughs> but but it seems it seems 1.8 is even better because the, even in the description they they, they, send, they mention something like a design for astro photography. I, I just really want to see this lens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It looks awesome. So Philip says, are there any tips for keeping the framing consistent with a Skyguider Pro when taking a panorama? So you're capturing a panorama and yeah. you're tracking, and now it's moving as you take your shot, and you want to keep that framing consistent. Any tips that you guys can think of that come to mind? Of course, you understand the question. Basically, yeah. you're capturing a panorama, and you're going from the far left or the far right of the arch, and you're doing a panorama one after another. It's hard oh. to keep that framing consistent since okay. your camera is moving so much in between. When you go to your next shot, what do you do to like rock it back? What what do you do to keep it so that each shot isn't just a progressively rotated shot of the sky? Okay, well, I can try to answer. Uh, well, the first of all, you don't really need just to precisely align between every image. You just have to have sufficient overlap. And if there is like slight rotation between the images, it doesn't really matter as long as there is a sufficient overlap. Now, how to do it consistently? Um, you can use one of the panoramic heads, what it's called. It's um, there are a variety of panoramic heads. One of them, it's essentially just a rotator where you 
mount your normal bulkhead on top and then you can just uh, there is a system which clicks on a certain amount of degrees and you know exactly by how much to to rotate because it's everything is pre-calculated uh, again i can give the whole master class on how to do panoramic imaging uh -oh, essentially the idea, that too. the whole idea is for given the foc focal lengths uh, uh, there is a certain amount of degrees you have to rotate your your head and this is a known number it's pre-calculated and then you simply take image just in this panoramic head click 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 you rotate by this amount and then you take image if it's like a one row panorama then if you do a, a multi-row panorama that's just you know you tilt your camera and you just go with the the same procedure again just you know in the opposite direction what were you going to say alan do you understand the question more yeah i think so um those yeah those indexing rotators that yuri was talking about are great because you don't have to turn your head torch on you just feel the clicks and mm -hmm. work in the dark really quick and easy so it's great um so i do my track panoramas with the the v mount on the star tracker so you use the v mount and basically when I, I'll, I'll take an image and i'll sweep across with sort of 40 50 percent overlap and then basically when i notice that the the electronic level on my camera is no longer straight and green and it's sort of slightly <laughs> tilted and yellow I'll just loosen up the V mount and just give it a little, a little nudge so that it's nice and flat again. Because when I'm doing panoramas, I like to make sure that all of my images are level. Otherwise, when you stitch them, they can sometimes be a bit wavy. Um, so I try and keep the horizon level as possible. So I'm holding a V mount right now from Alan Wallace, the Move Shoot Move V mount. He also has a Z mount. This isn't the Z bracket right here, mm -hmm. but basically, like as you can see here, my ball head is totally level, and this would be a V mount example of putting the ball head on a totally level plane. Yeah. And this helps tremendously. I'm not sure your situation enough, Philip, if you're not using any sort of V or Z bracket, mm -hmm. but those would help tremendously with the panoramas. And then you just do it like a regular panorama, really. I mean, you're rotating at the base of your ball head. And just point it at the spot you need. So then the next question from Doug. Have either of you tried the new Benro Polaris Astro motorized tripod head? Sadly not. Everyone keeps asking me, obviously, because I'm associated with Benro, but I'm, mm. I'm more associated with the UK. And this project is purely from Benro USA. Um, I think they've just started being sent out to Kickstarter backers. I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay. But the problem is it's what, what you call... Um, an alt as tracker an altitude azimuth tracker so normally with star trackers you polar align them and then they become equatorial trackers because you're turning equatorially um, but with the, the polaris you're basically moving the camera in altitude which is panning and az azimuth which is tilting and you're just never going to get anywhere near as accurate tracking as you can with an equatorially aligned tracker so my expectations are pretty low. They might get you to extend your shutter speed a little bit, but certainly not as much as a, an equatorially aligned tracker. Right on. Um, with some of these Q&A questions that we have, they're going to be running out of time before I can answer all of them. So I'm going to just go through some fast. Um, the question Quick from Faster question. saying, what's the best lens for night landscape for Sony specifically? Basically just a nice open Sony 24mm F1.4 G Master. Boom, nailed it. The next question, <laughs> Philip Montgomery says, the angle changed so drastically. It's simple with a tripod, but challenging with a tracker. I think the answer to that, Philip, I'll start, is just saying that a Z bracket helps with that angle change. Because when you're using it right off the, maybe the puck that's here typically off of your, um, off of this, oh, I forget the declination, declination bracket. bracket. Yeah. And then if you're using nothing else, but your ball head's just on top of it, it is a weird angle, and the Z bracket or V bracket will assist with that. Any other comments before I go to the next question? I'll scroll to the next one if you have any comments. Do do what is Yuri's YouTube channel? A second question about your Yuri's YouTube channel. So you have two subscribers right there, three if you count me, if I don't forget <laughs> to subscribe. And since we started to talk about lens, has anyone tried? Well, okay, we already answered that. Uh, which one do you suggest? Oh, we kind of covered all that. Every good tracker has benefits, and so you'll be fine with any chart tracker. Alan, I have a 20 millimeter 1.8. Do you suggest buying a 14 1.8 or a 24 1.4? Oh. <laughs> They're oh. so tight. That's a tight. Yeah, that's such a subjective question. I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of the 24 millimeter focal length because it's just great for panoramas. You end up with really nice high resolution. I'd probably see the 24. 20 is nice and wide. It's actually that that 20 mil lens, the Sony one, it's actually like 18 mil 
I'd it's say eighteen point five. Really eighteen, huh? Yeah, I measured it, and it's it's a bit wider than twenty mil. Oh, okay. Um, so I don't know. It depends if you prefer that super wide angle, easy one shot kind of thing, or if you'd like a twenty four mil and do panoramas and that kind of stuff. Personally, I'd go with twenty four. Awesome. Um, this is either a joke question or Kirk's also curious what your answer would be. But what color is the Milky Way? <laughs> what color? Look, look at my background. This is the real color. <laughs> I don't even think that Roger Clark would be upset with that image, Jerry. So well done. Um, uh, Jed Thornley. We, 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 can, we can have a long discussion with him. <laughs> <laughs> Jed Thornley is asking you, Alan, what beach and the time of year to photograph the plankton in the sea that, that illuminated... Uh, Bioluminescence, do you have any? I mean, I know it's not a guarantee, but what location do you start? Um, so for me, it's, it's close to home. It's in Wales, South Wales, North Wales coast, and usually in the hot summer months, um, June, July, normally the best. And you normally get the best displays when you have a good solid stint of clear skies and sunny weather um, because the plankton's... Um, it photosynthesizes? Wait... Yeah, it regenerates its lucifer by photosynthesizing sunlight. So you normally get the best displays after, um, you know, solid stints of clear skies. But it, you can get it all over the world. It's in Germany. It's in Norway. It's in, I mean, you've seen some amazing videos in California of dolphins swimming through the bioluminescence. So just have a little, do a little research and find out what's the closest location for, for you. Right on. Yuri, any comments on bioluminescence in Chile? I've never seen it, to be honest. Like, <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> so now this question is, I think, for all of us. Any chance of a Hawaii workshop soon? Do you plan on opening up a Hawaii workshop, Alan? I wouldn't technically be allowed visa-wise, and I've never been to Hawaii, so it's not something that's What if you collaborate my radar with right me? now? I want to go to Haleakala and do a deep sky workshop off I'm of I'm a special that. guest on your workshop. That, that'd be perfect. We'll work on that, 808 Flyer. Let's do that. And Yuri, do you have any workshops? Um, yeah, I mean, can, uh, I'll, with the pandemic time, it's of course, it's very difficult, but now we are ramping up again, so I'll be publishing soon. Just follow my Instagram. Go stay on the Instagram to find more of Yuri. Do you want to go to Hawaii with him or somewhere like the Atacama Desert? Uh, so here's a question for Yuri from Chris. Will J the JWT, the James Webb Telescope, be pretty images like Hubble or more like good data information? No, it will be both, actually both, because uh, uh, what is important to understand about like space telescopes and the space astronomy in general as well, uh, public outreach is, is essential and important part, integral part of the science mission as well. So the telescope will be also dedicating some of the time for mm, pretty pictures, let's put it this some way. Some visible yeah. light shots? Okay. Visible, not not visible light shots, but infrared. Yes, infrared, but Different. pretty pictures. Oh, awesome! Man, I can't wait to start seeing some of that. So then, Helber asked, "Does the Botanov mask work with short focal length?" I have not used Botanov mask outside of my um, red cat has a Botanov mask mm -hmm. on it. Do you guys have enough experience with Botanov mask on a short focal yeah. length? Uh, what well, does it work? My my opinion is just it's not worth it. Like seriously, it's just uh, I mean the life you, especially on the short focal lengths, it's it's absolutely just it's all it's more than enough. I mean, it's usually you use magnification up to 10, 15, or twenty depends on the ca camera model and and focusing on the life view, it's it's super quick. You don't really have to hunt the focus. It's like a second's job. You know, it's easy. So I never use a buffed enough on short focal lengths. Right on. Okay, I have a comment here. I'm going to pop this out so I can see this easier on the Facebook chat because I was getting a long comment that was all like two words at a time in a long, long giant uh, square. From Dehan, he said, Dehan says, get out first time. I got out first time with my Sony 14 millimeter A7 IV. I'm getting winged stars in the corners. Any pointers for fixing this coma or testing for faults? Could I? Could it be I just need to shoot with it more? So, Alan, did you have an answer for that? Talking about that comb in the corner on the Sony 14 millimeter. That's interesting. Maybe a bad copy. I'm not 100%. Mine's pretty good, although I do step it down to f2 or f2.2 rather than f1.8. Or it might just be that the Sony a7 IV is because it's more high megapixel. You see the effect of the astigmatism more than I do on my lower megapixel camera. I'll mm -hmm. find out soon enough because my a7 IV is on the way from Spencer's cameras. Awesome. Um, so yeah, stop the lens down to f2, f2.2. And with these like crazy ultra wide angle lens, because the you normally get a high field curvature, 
Um, rather than focusing on a star that's in the middle of the frame, focus on a star that's like one third from the top and side edge. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that will give you a much more even focus across the frame. That's a good idea. Right at the center. He was mentioning yeah. more of his was less that angel wings kind of coma and more of a V shape. He's getting V poles in the corner, I should say. Like, uh, how do I do this? How do yeah, I, I know what you mean. Hand? <laughs> you know, it's like a, a combination oh. between coming and staying with him. Yeah, I can a, take it. I can give you like a general advice for any lens. I mean, because sometimes you can pretty much in nightscape, you can use any lens and make the image perfect. And there is a very simple way to do it panorama. You can use the, the worst lens ever, but once you start making panorama with a sufficient overlap, and then you can stitch everything. So the stitching algorithm, what it does, it select the best part of each image and combine them in the in the stitch panorama. So this is how you avoid uh, eliminate essentially to completely eliminate aberrations. That's what I'm saying. Like uh, uh, sometimes people say, oh, I need this the best, the most expensive lens. No, actually you don't. You just have to know how to properly image. So you do panoramic imaging. And it, again, it's not really much of an overlap time, but in, in, a, in, a, in the end, you will get really much better result than any single shot, that's for sure. All right, awesome. Great question to Han, thank you so much. So then Steve says, use a, oh, he's answering a question in all caps. So he's talking to us saying, use a two-way head and index rotator. So he's talking about the previous discussion mm -hmm. about the panorama. Bum, 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 I'm not seeing all caps, not seeing all caps. And Sean Maloney says, what up, Photog people? Hey, Sean, welcome in, man. So Sean comes from Louisiana and he's always doing the seven, eight hour long, narrow band, deep sky stuff. He's got some awesome stuff. If you guys want to Red Stick Astro, check out his work. He's got great deep sky stuff. In fact, picture right there needs to be hung up higher. I haven't hung it up yet, but it's it's actually Sean's print. So we are at the end of this event, the end of our day. Let's go ahead. Yuri, you already mentioned it. It is your Instagram that is the best place to follow mm -hmm. you. If yeah. I were to pull it up again, I gotta find that window. Yuri Beletsky. Everyone, if you want to say thank you and you haven't already, go to Yuri Beletsky's Instagram. Oh, looks like I'm on Fine Art America right now. Let's go to Instagram again and go to Yuri. Fine Art site is just for the prints. It's not like my personal site. It's only if you want to print one of my images. Usually people look at my Instagram and they say, I would like this image. I put this on the fine prints and people can just order a print. But pretty much all my images go to Instagram, so it's probably the place number one. And these are gorgeous. And so if you would like to follow Matt, this is a great Neowise picture. So jealous. Awesome. So then if you want to also say thank you to Alan Wallace, I said thank you to him today and finally followed him on Instagram. You can join me <laughs> <laughs> and be one of our 69,000 followers and follow him on Instagram and check out his work there. And Alan, where else can we point everyone to come check out your work and any workshops available that you're selling? Come on over to YouTube, of course. Um, my website, I don't update my website enough. It's so outdated right now, but <laughs> I feel you. Um, sign up to my mailing list because that's where I have the best contact with my followers. And I always give out discounts and news on stuff that's coming out, like my book or hopefully the new filter, which I get back on the market soon. Um, so yeah, newsletter, you can sign up on my website and, and YouTube, Instagram. Awesome. I'm getting a bunch of thank you. Thanks and to all. Yes, go ahead. I will be in the Nightscaper conference in a couple of months' time. Yuri, you. you're in the Nightscaper conference too or not this year? No, yeah, this I'm coming. Year, no. I'm coming. Oh, okay. Yuri, no. Yuri is not, but Alan actually is in person as well. For those of us who are at the Nightscaper conference, we get to hang out with Alan Wallace in May or April, yeah. actually, end of April. April, yeah. So I'm getting a lot of thanks from everybody. Thanks to all from Alan. Steve Segnati says, thank you. Oh, actually, no, Philip says, thank you to Steve Segnati. And then Steve says, thanks for the round table. Great information. Thank you, Alan and Yuri. Jed says, thank you. Great YouTube. Matthew says, amazing live round table, Alan and Yuri. Thank you so much. 808 Flyer says, mahalo for the round table. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you for watching and thanks for hanging out with us today. If you're not a member of the Milky Way Photographers Guild, go join us over there and get away from the Facebook ads and all the Facebook nonsense and just celebrate what's right with the world we're in solidarity worrying about the lives of those being shed in ukraine and also feeling for some of the russian soldiers who are just following orders and possibly 
meeting their end as well. So hope that we don't have to deal with that too long and glad that we can have things in our life that we celebrate and be happy about, like Milky Way photography and astrophotography. We're stoked to do it. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions for me that you would like Alan or Yuri to come back on and talk about a very specific lesson, like the master class that Yuri mentioned that he would be able to do, just hit me up in an email at uh, Aaron at photogadventures.com. Check it out. Kathy says, see you at Nightscaper. Uh, Philip says, thank you, Alan, Yuri, and Aaron. Mirkovo says, thumbs up, go whales. And uh, Mike says, thanks, guys. Steve says, oh, he's answering St Philip. And Fred says, thanks a lot. Kirk says, thanks, you, Alan, and Yuri. Thanks, you. Oh, I did say I did say that right. I read it correctly, Kirk. You wrote it that way. Thank you, Alan and Yuri. Joe says, thanks, guys. Great show. Nightscaper, I'll be there, says Kirk. Thank you all. Thank you all. Chris says, thank Sweet. you. Awesome. Big thanks from Faster. Big thumbs up. He's out there in Peru. We're all going to go to Machu Picchu with Faster. We're going to break in at <laughs> night, and we're going to do it. I don't want to damage or even touch Machu Picchu. I just want them to be in my frame down below. I just want to be in the hills nearby. Helber says, thanks, Aaron, for organizing the roundtable. You bet. Thank you all. I hope you'll join us in the guild. And everyone, get out there with your camera. Have an adventure of your own. Don't waste all this time. If you have the moon working for you and the skies working for you, get out there with your camera and capture what you can see. Plenty of beauty, especially if you're tracking with a star tracker. So, all right, everyone have a good one and see you later.